So, it's a beautiful day. What's an architect to do? Specifically, someone has spent a quarter million dollars and you're spending the best four years of your life, maybe five. Uh, and how are you going to get what you need to get out of the next two hours? Very recently, you wrote uh, some target questions and you submitted them on Brightspace. Thank you. The reason I had you think about it, write it down, and submit and commit uh, and upload it is so that you'd be ready for this moment of truth, which is this moment of truth is um, what target questions do you have for this lecture? Here are some from the morning. If your target question matches one of these, um, then please suggest a further question or an intensification or a, tar a more focused way to ask this question. But I want to hear from everyone. What's your target question? Yes, Yon. I have three with three rides. The first one was, due to the application for the resolution on the motor side of the region. Where should I write it? I'm going to write it here. So it's looking back. How has auto mobility <laughs> impacted? What form of our cities? Our stand. Our structure. How it works inside. Form. Forms. Okay. Next. Let's just let's get one from everyone. Let's go from Johanna, let's go to Lyle. Is this supposed to be specifically about auto transportation? No. Um, it's what do you what do you need from this lecture? Specifically of the wealthiest one percent. Right. Sorry, I'm just short. Does that work? Okay. Well. Yeah. Or something better. Uh, one of my questions is for my data. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I know Houston is a very car designed city. How do we find the balance between automotive? priority and kind of the priority of more, I guess, public transportation. Um, there's a term called mode split. Mm -hmm. Which is a useful term. 
term? What's the proper mode split between car and transit? Yeah. Okay. Specifically, you're thinking Houston. I mean, I know that Houston is really, really bad we'll in see terms it. of the urban planning and design of it, where like 50% of their downtown is just parking lots. 85. 85, yeah. It, which is just like absurd. And they have like the worst traffic in, in the country. The prosecution will call to the stand the city of Houston. Okay. Yeah. So I am curious about that. Yeah. Your turn. Um, Question is, what do we solve urban sprawl? How do we solve urban sprawl? Wow, you guys are aiming big. So, so I'm kind of adding to the mobility that's already on the board. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. how can architects design for multiplayer mobility? There was something in the reading about like um, like symbiotic relationships between transportation modes, where like one doesn't have to subordinate the other. So, uh, looking at it as a system, right? Okay. Are we able to integrate uh, like car travel with? Uh, Communities that aren't developing new highway systems. Without new highways. So make the most of automobile transportation without new highways. I like that. Okay. So, what you got? Is it truly feasible to change current transportation infrastructure and then planning where we design or is it scope too large or is it something Where do we have to look long term? It's really long term. What's the time frame of system change? I'm gonna can I rephrase it? What's the time frame of system change? <coughs> and who worked on the Uri read? Rob, is it John Uri? What's his first name? Robert Uri? John Uri? John. Yeah. What what did he say? What does he say the time frame of system changes? It's in the sketch writing right now. Okay. Athena. Wow. How can we get a civic urban scale that shifts lifestyles for lower carbon? For a post post carbon future. Okay. Are we supposed to read our questions? You're supposed to, such a strong. Um, how about this? Your target question, as you conceived it, or, or something better than okay. given what you see on the board. Okay. I don't know. Really long one? Yeah. Please short. You want to give me a second? Um, so I have a question going on. Okay.
So what's the question part of that? Like how does it specifically pertain to the location of this How dependent is change on culture, geography, economy of a place? Okay. Yeah. Um, how can we develop a common goal and sense of togetherness so that we can move forward and develop a more conscious life, like ed society? A shared vision. Yeah. Better arrangements. Yeah. And the word arrangements, you should recognize that. We're always talking about formal spatial institutional arrangements. That's what we do. We're in the formal spatial institutional arrangement business. You want to change some formal spatial institutional arrangements? Call the architects. It says it on our card. We specialize in altering formal spatial institutional arrangements. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. Where's Ryan? That was his line. So thank you, Josh. So much for that. Okay, Mackenzie. How can we bring the rural areas to the Um, is anyone okay? Maybe can I suggest a rewording? How? Can we reconfigure, rearrange, rearrange even rural places to use transit? Because up until now, the answer is no. Rural, no transit, get a truck. But there are tricks. That's an interesting question. Right? Um, how can we decide to make it for So some of these are not that difficult, and some of them are even already answered <clears throat> in your in the reading. So some of the answers, some so there are some very solid responses already available to us in what people have studied, what people have written. It also, uh, and a lot of them are answerable in what we've studied and written in the last two days. So in the sketch writing are some of, uh, at least the preliminary responses to some of these questions. Um, uh, I, I'm most interested, now what are the hardest questions? We can't, we can't address all of these. What are the most significant questions? So I'm gonna say um, one of them is, what, what's this term project? It's, it's, Piggyback on that question that came up this morning. What's who can nominate another? I'm going to go ahead and say any good alternatives. I'm going to make that number two because that's what you have to do for the analysis. Right? It's due on Saturday. What? There's something due on Saturday? What about 4th of July? Do it before the weekend starts if you can. I hear a rumor that there's no class on Wednesday. Yeah. Is that true? Okay. Um, what other questions up here um, deserve special attention? Let's pair these two and make it three. Who else has got something to nominate?
connect those two with the time frame system change. Do you want to help? <coughs> no one, you, you don't want to help? I need your help. I'm still trying to read them. Oh, is my handwriting bad? No. I was just long text. What's the time frame of system change? How do we balance the short and long term priorities? Uh, to make it real, should Joe Biden uh, release more oil from the national uh, national stockpile of oil reserves for emergencies in order to reduce gas prices? Or should he embrace the higher cost of gasoline as a way to incentivize more green energy so we can finally make some progress on our climate change goals. And specifically, will you vote for him if he works towards climate change at the expense of what we pay for gas? How many of you drive? How many of you drove here today? Um, okay, 10 years from now, you're going to be driving? Who's going to drive 10 years from now? Who's going to drive on a daily basis 10 years from now? You're not? Athena, you're not going to drive? You're not going to drive? Who's not going to drive in 10 years? Where do you want to live? And you choose a place so that you don't have to drive? Who's wanting to choose a place so that you don't have to drive? I want to live in a city. I'm not saying I don't have a car. Let's be reasonable. I'm not a loser, right? The only losers wouldn't have a car. But I want to be such a winner that I can either drive my car or not drive my car. I prefer not to drive my car. Who's with me? It sounds better now? Okay. Yeah, it's not crazy to say, uh, listen, I'm going to drive my car until the day I die, or you offer me something better than driving my car. You offer me something better than driving my car. I'm not going to drive my car. I'm not stupid. That answers like five of these questions right there. What can architects do? We can help build a system where it's more attractive to not drive than it is to drive. Have you been to Zurich, Switzerland? What's it like in Zurich? You want to report? Uh, well, you, you, didn't, you, you didn't take the mass transportation yeah. in Zurich. Did you? But the mayor, the mayor of Zurich, he doesn't have a car. <laughs> he, takes, he takes the subway to work. Right? Why? Because He's not stupid. Everyone takes the subway to work in Zurich. It's cheap, it's clean, it's convenient, it's sociable, it's pleasant, it's fun, it's fast. Who wouldn't? Question? Oh, damn. No question. So, um, are we good? Anything? How do we solve small? I mean, that connects with everything. What can architects do? And we can create symbiotic multi layered mobility, whatever the heck that is. Okay. Is this a good set of target questions? So let's go to the first question. Um, What's this I hear about a term project? Is that, a, is that actually a thing?
So if you go into Brightspace, did you see this term project? Turns out on July 9th at 6 p.m., it's a week from Saturday, uh, you have something due on your term project. What? You have a term project? Yes, we have a term project. Um, do you have something due? Coming up? Yes, we have something due. We have some new something due. It's due on 6 p.m. Saturday, of July. Just to keep the rhythm going, I know you have this empty feeling inside, nothing to do on Saturday. So I want you to feel well engaged. And then the next thing is due on the 27th of July. So, any questions? I'm also seeing a, an individual reading selection due. Is that separate? No, that's this. Oh, because it says it's due July 6th on the space. Oh, update. But I, there's like two different. It's this one and there's another reading selection. Really, where's that? Um, Fascinating. Okay. I uh, don't know why that's not deleted, and I'll look into that. July 9th, there's no school. We celebrate our nation's independence or something. On July 6th, I'll do the work. But when you come back to business, take care of this business, this is what's due. What's due? A list of three. Uh, sources that are worthy of our attention. Uh, imagine someone's paying a quarter million dollars for education, and you're taking this pretty good class, but it's missing. It's missing some important content. I have to share my hands up this. You're taking this class with this guy, and you're doing all this analysis and sketch writing, but it's not really giving me what I want. Who's with me? Thank you. It's not really giving me what I want. I'm curious about, what are you curious about? What are you gonna do about it? I'm gonna read, I'm gonna do a sketch writing, I'm gonna choose some images, I'm gonna do an analysis, and I'm gonna write three paragraphs. And it's gonna be worth two, I'm, what's this, let me do the math. Carry, carry the math. Two hundred points, wow. That's a lot of points. That's something like 40% of your grade. It's worth a lot, Joe. So is this just like a larger sketch writing? It's a larger- Or an analysis and a sketch writing put together and then on steroids. So you should notice a pattern in your week, right? In the studio, it's like, ah, ah, it's like emergency, drop everything, reviews, don't go to classes, especially structures, right? <laughs> um, but in this class, <sighs> right? go to class on Monday, spend two hours or so, right? How much time did you spend? On the reading? In sketch, reading and sketch writing? Yeah, it's generous, right? Some people do it, it's fine. Um, so on Monday, I'll go to class. Between Monday and Wednesday, I do my sketch writing. It's fine. No drama, no biggie. It's blocked out my calendar. I just take care of business. It's like brushing your teeth. It's an inhale, exhale. This is the inhale sketch writing. And now, and here's some more inhale. And Wednesday, I show up and talks and talks and talks. And sometimes it gets to the lecture, sometimes it gets to the world. Um, and we inhale some more. And there's some foundational information for the real the real activity here so i'm getting ready to be a leader in the profession i'm developing the skills of looking at the world learning what i what can be learned from that analysis of the world and and i'm generating some insights from that i do that every week all summer long like clockwork, boom, boom, boom. 
I never call up your studio professors and say, oh, they have a really big analysis due on Saturday. Can, can you postpone your review? Uh, so I don't do that to them. And on a good day, they don't do that to us in the non studio courses. And when I teach studio, which I do teach studio, um, I don't ask the other professors to postpone the deadlines. This is the no drama course. And you go through week after week, no drama. It's just taking care of business. Inhale, exhale, brush my teeth. And when the end of July comes and the beginning of August comes, just do it again. What is the expectation for the term project? It's this. Might take a little longer to do the sketch right. So that's why maybe you should get a head start on this. Maybe you should pick read, maybe you should pick readings next Monday. And the next Monday, what do you mean? We're doing sketch writing based on the readings we choose. Yes. I, we're going to talk about the three readings, three or more readings you bring in. We're going to help select one. You're going to do a sketch writing. You're going to choose a few images. You're going to do an analysis. You're going to take that analysis and you're going to write a paragraph before to situate the issues. And then you're going to write a paragraph after to codify the principles that you learn out of the analysis. And there's visual evidence in each one. You can make a diagram that captures the principles upon which we should go. You don't have to. It's only with four points. Please choose three. Is there kind of some guidelines in terms of what readings you should pick? There's, uh, you requested it, and here it is the architecture program bibliography, uh, assembled by Antonio and I. You're welcome. And there it is. There's uh, adaptive reuse, building technology, urbanism. Probably the urbanism is the right place in the book. So three or four pages of sources that we recommend. You can choose one of those or choose one of your own. Uh, but we hope it's a serious piece of writing at the cutting edge. Someone at the Eight O'Clock group said, Yeah, it's like the Peter the Tank. And I said, Well, your clients, uh, if they're looking for Encyclopedia Britannica type knowledge, they don't need to hire an architect. So they just look it up and say, like, The world expects you to have access to something more cutting edge, more impactful, more hopeful, and more effective. And so, Art Daily? No. Encyclopedia Britannica? Probably no. Uh, Wikipedia? No. We're looking for something substantive where some nutty architect has this idea and they publish it and they're expecting their colleagues to verify and correct the speculations. Uh, they're probably going to do it in a journal article or a book chapter or a book. Like the Peter Calthorpe book is a beautiful example of the kind of thing that he works his career on, he puts it out there, and he wants us to learn from it, verify it for ourselves, and correct the things that he's getting wrong. Like, perfect example. So that's the kind of reading. 20 to 40 pages is a good length. Other questions about this assignment? Okay. So we did we did that one project. We're good. We know what we're doing and why. Number two, are there any good alternatives? If I can get through the lecture material in time, we'll look at that. We'll look at good alternatives. Um, <laughs> What's the difference between reducing, so 
reducing traffic flow, reducing traffic jams, increasing traffic flows used to be the goal of our profession. And then we've shifted about several decades ago from reduced from yeah, traffic flows is part of it, but a better way to describe what we're trying to do in the profession is increase mobility. We what puts the most people where they need to get to with the least cost, the least amount of time. Right? So we've shifted from reducing traffic jams to increasing mobility. And then, especially since the pandemic, we're, we're moving beyond mobility to access. Sometimes we need physical access. There's no substitute. I'm sorry, I don't like going to church uh, on Zoom, right? Physical presence is what you need to really have that experience. But some things like faculty meetings, I'm fine on Zoom. I don't have to get in my Hummer and navigate Boston traffic and contribute to Boston traffic. You know, I don't have to be driving down the road in my Hummer, right? Uh, to get to a faculty meeting, I can just access it by Zoom. So that's question number three, symbiotic multi-layered mobility. So um, let's get into the lecture and see if we can get at some of these, especially long-term, short-term. Um, but before we do, let's see if we can knock off um, the time frame question. In the reading, John Uri, what does John Uri say? Where's that? I thought I saw it. What does John Uri say about the time frame thing? Quincy and Robbie. No, maybe it's later. Gabe and Laura, they're not here. So one of the things they said is they talk about, Uri, Uri talks about the tipping point, the tipping point of, uh, remember cell phones? No, you don't. You don't remember a pre-cell phone world. Ask your parents about the cell phone thing. It was, I think it was in the 90s when this new thing was happening, cell phones. And we thought, you know, there's going to be like a major shift. Like by the end of this year, let's say it's 97 and 98, we expect uh, 1.5 million units of sale of cell phones. Was it 1.5 million? No, it was like 150 million. We, we miscalculated by a factor of like 100. We were so off. There was a tipping point that happened. It turns out it's so much cheaper to put up cell towers than to create uh, telephone lines. And so we stopped investing in telephone lines throughout the developing world. And everyone in Africa, pretty much, everyone in Asia, pretty much, has a cell phone because you know what it takes to get someone to show up from the corrupt tele telephone bureau to run a, a line into your house anywhere in Asia or Africa? Just forget it. It's so corrupt. You have to spend a fortune. It's so much cheaper just to get a cell phone. So that's what happened. And so the cell phone thing happened. It was transformative. It happened overnight. Uri, if you, if you look at um, what Gabe and Laura have written, captured in the sketch writing, um, refer here to a system that will emerge unpredictably, which means like the cell phone. Like you'll wake up and boom, uh, the car is not going to go away, but man, is it going to change. Questions about that? Nothing? Um, the the uh, automobility reading by John Uri, only four of you 
did it on sketch writing, but it's short and it's really dense and impactful. Um, when I started teaching at Rhode Island School of Design in 2003, the, uh, the director said, uh, what can you teach that will help architects uh, get a sense of a bigger role for architecture in the world? And I said, that's easy. Um, I'm going to teach uh, a course called Automobile. So I taught this topic as a semester long course at, um, at RISD, and then I taught it here. Um, and it, it worked. And there are two reasons why we love this topic as architects. First of all, it helps us understand the world. How many of you, in a, in a way that isn't taught, it just isn't taught. Have you talked about cars and the car system in the studio? East Boston? Did you do parking in that housing project? Yeah. How much parking did you have? Some of the sites didn't even require parking. Yeah, they were not impacted. So, so, how does that make you feel? Do you feel ready to? Be a practicing profession. Okay. Is that enough for an architect for your training? Right. Now, um, what are the forces that have transformed our world world profoundly? What is the single, arguably the single biggest factor? That has led to the transformation of the world we live in. Yeah. 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 More specifically, is it him? Highway transportation system. Yeah. The whole thing. Like, how do you even say it? It's cars, but wait a minute. A car is just a car. Like, is this? Is this about cars? Yeah, but it's just about cars. Like we could teach this class. We could look at cars and how we move from gas powered engines to hybrid and you know, to all electric and then we'd be good. Right? And, but what's that to do with architecture? That would not even begin to touch the transformation of first the United States and now in the next 50 years, the rest of the planet. It's an ongoing process of complete and total demolition and reconfiguration of every town, city, and village in the world in order to accommodate this system. And according to Uri, and I do recommend uh, reading this uh, article, in your spare time over this celebratory week. It's not just the cars. It's not just the cars and the roads. It's not just the cars and the garages and the driveways that alter our homes. Right? It's also the cars, the alteration of homes, the streets we live on, the road system that transforms the landscape, the uh, infrastructures of petroleum distribution, the gas stations, the refinery towers, the oil tankers. It's not just all of that. It's not just the businesses that have become first the, the primary pillar driving the American economy, and then uh, the primary uh, economic pillar of China or, or Germany, uh, ding, 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 country after country, but not China, Japan. Even though the Japanese don't have cars, they are uh, the biggest uh, per capita contributor of foreign aid. What does Japanese foreign aid go to? Road construction so that the Japanese automakers can sell cars. It's a beautiful formula if you don't care about destroying the planet. Oh, and the sixth thing that uh, Uri lists on that list of six things, which we could go back, I bet it's in the sketch writing. Um, right? The six things? Six factors? Yeah. So it's like, uh, what's the number six? Oh, uh, number six is the environmental. Yeah. The single largest factor 
in global climate change is private automobile use. How'd we get here? Very quickly, no time. Remember Dubai where the only reason you have the building is to mobilize financial forces and have a safe investment. Um, remember in China, the reason they built these ghost cities is to capture the value of the land so that they can build the infrastructure of China. And, uh, well, this is started in the United States. Um, you wanna build an interstate railway system in 1850s, which we did. Step one, mobilize your national military to clear the prior occupants of the land uh, through genocide and displacement. Then lay out a grid. Thank you, Thomas Jefferson. In May 1802, when he was president, he said, hey, I know, let's put a grid down and uh, uh, so we can commodify land and build it very quickly from sea to shine. Well, later it became from sea to shining sea. Um, at his time, it was just that farmland as our states extend beyond the Appalachian Mountains, let's create an orderly um, gridded land system. Uh, but what it does at, at this time is it means that way back in Baltimore and New York, and those are the two cities where this happened, uh, we can uh, go into the trading hall and we can purchase uh, a thousand we, we can purchase land uh, and it doesn't matter. We don't have to visit the land. It's the same 40 acre square. We assume it's the same 40 acre square or the same six mile by six mile square. The, the land is more or less of equal value no matter where it is. So we can buy and sell land to our hearts content without ever going there and seeing the land because every parcel is more or less of equal value. That's the commodification of land. It's an extreme perverse version of what we looked at in the New Earth uh, reading Shadow Cities, where property value, um, just like the Chinese created uh, under the communist system, what's the value of an acre of land in China? Zero. There's no land market. The government, the state owns all the land, so it's worth zero. As soon as you create a mechanism for selling uh, that parcel of land in China. You can sell it for $1, and then a year later, you can sell it for $10, $100, $1,000. And it, it generates piles of cash uh, beyond anybody's wildest imaginings. That's how they finance the railroad, railway system. Uh, the US government turned over the railway companies said, I think this is a good route for a railway. Uh, and the US government said, let's give you uh, 25 miles on either side. I think that's 25 miles. On either side of the railway. And we'll give that land to the railway company. Uh, the way the railway company can afford to mobilize an army of Chinese, mostly Chinese immigrants, to build this railway system is that they are buying and selling the land on either side. The, the land on either side is worth basically nothing without the railway, but just the story being told, we're gonna to build a railway and there's gonna be towns uh, along the way and the agricultural land on either side near those towns will be worth money because you can grow stuff here, bring it into town, bring it into the railway depot, and bring it to St. Louis and um, sell it. So off we go. This is the financing, using land to finance the railway system. The same thing happens at a different scale in the towns all around the world where the, this is called the streetcar suburb, where the reason the grids of our cities, and I think that's, that looks like East St. Louis. Um, the reason the, 
grids of our towns look this way is because there's a port on the river, uh, warehouses and factories uh, locate near the port, and the workforce has to live within walking distance because that's the only way we can get to and from work. Then what happens? Then uh, and this is uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis. Uh, the agricultural land beyond that walking distance circle, like you can see this walking distance circle at the core of these four towns. And then beyond that walking distance circle, uh, land developers purchase the agricultural land. They can buy it for a dollar an acre. And uh, it's, it's worth not much until they you know they want to build houses and how do they make that land of any value to anyone for houses they use uh, the promise of future earnings from selling all these houses to build a streetcar so every black line is a streetcar that is financed by the land development around the streetcar how cool is that? So each, each of these streetcar lines is a different subdivision offering residential property uh, and they build houses jump. So is that is this still carry over to now in terms of like highways and stuff? Saying if we build a highway here, this place will be more connected? Because I, I don't know. What a great question. We dismantled this mechanism. Okay, that's what I was, that's what I was The government builds freeways, the value increases, and the government doesn't get that increased value. We give it away to the landowners. That brings us back to Union Square. When you get to that studio, if that's the topic, uh, the government and you and the citizens and the taxpayers and the federal government and the state government are subsidizing the extension of the Green Line to Union Square. and what happens to the land values at Union Square? I have to start down here because it goes, oh my God, the land value just went up tremendously. Who gets that land value? The owners. We privatize the benefits of this infrastructure provision in the United States. We're the only ones who do that. And even we didn't do it back here. The only way throughout human history and even in the United States until recently, the only way anyone builds a train line is by capturing the increased value of the land that happens when you build a train line. How else would you finance a train line? You know how expensive it is to build a train line? Oh, it's very expensive. Hundred million dollars a kilometer in a lot of cities because of the value of the land. It's very expensive. How much, I wonder how much it costs to extend the green line per mile huge. So this is how the streetcar systems were built in Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, Madison, Milwaukee, uh, and Nema City, Boston, New York, <clears throat> Brisbane, Glasgow, Shanghai, Manila, Jakarta, Accra, name a city where this didn't happen. Oh, I can't. It happened in every city in the world in the ninth, uh, up, around, throughout the, the peak of this was in the 1920s. So every city in the world had a garden city extension based on uh, the streetcar model of urban growth. And it's an architectural model as well that you will recognize uh, in Boston. The Green Line is a streetcar suburb. If you, if you see Dorchester or this neighborhood or uh, Brookline, Newton, every place that there is a Green Line you see the streetcar suburb pattern. And somehow Boston held on to its streetcar. I don't know the history of that, but I bet it's interesting. 
here's a place where, uh, what is this place? California, where California? Yeah, I would say LA, except it's got streetcars. Everyone knows nobody walks in LA. No, there's no streetcar system in LA. LA is the automobile capital of the world. Ask your parents about the song, Nobody Walks in LA. Um, but nobody walks in LA. There's no transit at all. There's this horrible bus system until recently when they, at huge expense, they've started to build uh, metro systems and a light rail system up to Pasadena. And so some of these have been built recently. But what's this map? This is LA in the 20s and the 30s when it had not only did it have a streetcar system, it had the biggest, most complete streetcar street system of any system in the world. What happened? No time, no time, no time. You know this movie? It's ridiculous, right? It's a cartoon. It's ridiculous. It's good. Remember this scene? Okay. See if you can follow the plot. The good guys get captured by the bad guys, and the bad guys explain their sinister plan. Do you remember, remember the sinister plan? This part of the movie. I mean, it's just a cartoon. It's such a joke. Okay? He, the villain had this kooky idea of buying all of the streetcar lines in Los Angeles, ripping the tracks out of the ground burning the trolleys, replacing the high efficiently, very effective streetcar system of the greatest transit metropolis in the world, and replacing it with buses, and then reduce the frequency of bus service. You know why? He wants to sell cars. First of all, he wants to sell buses and tires for those buses and gasoline for those buses. Then, he wants, once the, the system has been replaced and all the, the trolley cars are burned and the tracks have been pulled out of the ground, uh, he sells all the buses, pocket the money for all the bus, the selling of the buses and the, and the tires and the gas. Then slowly but slowly reduce the frequency of bus service, reduce the quality of bus service, reduce the dependability of bus service, until we wake up today and only losers drive the bus. Who's with me? Right? <laughs> I mean, who in the right mind would bicycle? I mean, get a job. Right? Have some self respect. Where's your dignity, man? Grow up, get a car. Right? We know who the winners are, we know who the losers are because of this structure that was created, right? But this is just a cartoon. That would never happen in real life, right? Everyone except for the one in 10 who owned an automobile uh, used rail. At that time, Alfred P. Sloan said, wait a minute, this is a great opportunity. I mean, we've got 90% of the market out there that we can somehow turn into automobile users. Eliminate the rail alternatives, we will create a new market for our cars. And if we don't, then this whole, you know, the entire General Motors sales are just going to be, are going to be lovely. They had to get rid of the streetcars. They wanted the space that the streetcars used for automobiles. Wait, I thought this was a cartoon. <laughs> They had to find something they could put in place for the streetcar. Sloan had the concept that he wanted to somehow motorize all the major cities of the country that meant uh, replacing all the street railways with buses. And ultimately thinking that no one would want to ride the buses and therefore they'd buy General Motors automobiles. Sloan wanted to get in very big in this field. What he bought was phenomenal the largest bus operating company in the country, and the largest bus production company. 
And using that as a foothold, GM moved into Manhattan. They acquired interest in the New York railways, and between 1926 and 36, they methodically destroyed the rails. When they finally motorized New York, General Motors issued these, these ads throughout the country, and this is important because they're trying to show that motorization is the wave of the future. They issued these ads and it said, the motorization of 4th and Madison is the most important and ethical event in the history of community transportation. In the mid-1930s, GM worked hard to create the impression of a nationwide trend away from rail. But there was no trend. Buses were a tough sell. They jolted, they smelled, they inched through traffic. City by city, it took the hidden hand of General Motors to replace streetcars with yellow coach buses. In 1936, the company was founded that would grow to dominate American city transportation. We don't have time. If you want the full clip, it's in the slides uh, on Brightspace. Um, I also, it's recorded in the 8 o'clock lecture. The 8 o'clock lecture, we didn't get to the good alternatives part of the lecture, so I'm going to cut this part short. Sorry, the punchline that uh, isn't in the film anyway. But maybe this I haven't watched it now. The punchline is um, there was a whistleblower in the 40s who blew the whistle and said National City Lines is not a family owned and operated company. It is a, a secret operation funded by General Motors, Firestone Tires. Mack truck, uh, one of the gasoline companies, I can't remember, but it's a conglomerate effort to, uh, it was a conspiracy. It was the topic of a federal lawsuit. Uh, uh, no, I think it was a criminal suit uh, where four companies were found guilty as charged of conspiracy to defraud the American people. And so you've all heard about this, right? Because it was a huge, big thing and they had to pay reparations and we had to fund the rebuilding of our transit system in the 86 cities where they were convicted of dismantling it. Wrong. They were found guilty of dismantling the transit system in the 86 cities and they were fined. Each of the four companies, no jail time. Each of the four companies had to pay reparations. They had to write a check for the court. How much? How much would it cost to replace? How much did it cost for LA to rebuild some of its transit? So they, here's a hint. They were fined at an amount less than it cost to rebuild LA's transit system. They were each fined $1. And then and then you don't hear about it. But that's the world. They created the world that we've inherited. And our system is. They burned the trolleys. The suburbs wouldn't exist if it weren't for cheap oil. Um, the U.S. is a car culture. The automobile industry started in the U.S. And really, the automobile industry got, it got its start here because we were looking for ways to use that cheap oil. The U.S. was awash in oil in the early 20th century. In the 1930s, they were discovering the stuff so fast that uh, oil in Texas was cheaper than drinking water by the carload. So um, this... Uh This, uh, this story is uh, a deep story and uh, it tells us how the built environment became so distorted by these forces. And it's, 
Um, it's a story that helps us understand how structural forces uh, operate and how architecture becomes a vehicle for reproducing those structural forces. Um, so we're going to look at Ford Motor Company and General Motors, uh, the two big uh, automobile companies in the United States. It starts with this uh, idea of using photography, both in uh, the Soviet Union and in the United States and in Europe, to study human motion and to increase efficiency, to optimize human motion, which uh, leads to mass production, the efficiency of the assembly line based on uh, repetitive mo movement so that each worker becomes a cog in this large industrial machinery. Um, so that's Taylorism, is the efficiency of repeated motions. But what is Fordism? Fordism goes beyond Taylorism. Fordism is Taylorism, mass production, plus what, what Henry Ford did, he didn't just bring the efficiency of the assembly line to the production of the Model T Ford in 1907. He actually did a radical thing. What's the uh, minimum wage now? All the US or all the US? Let's say the US. Yeah, it's like 750 and going up. So at this time, a dollar a day was a good wage. You could do a lot with a dollar a day, but you couldn't buy a car. So Henry Ford had two problems, how to reduce the cost of the automobile, but he wasn't satisfied there. How do you increase demand for the automobile? You force wages up, not just in the automobile industry, but then everybody else has to compete. So he raised the wage of his workers from $1 a day to $3 a day. That's like taking the minimum wage in Boston and skipping right over the $15 an hour uh, target that we have going right to 30. Let's just go straight to $30. And that's what Henry Ford did. And what it did, uh, this is really at the core of the history of the 20th century. How we've talked about this, how did the middle class, back when we could actually call it with a straight face, when we could call it the middle class, when it was the middle of something, if you were white, uh, it's because of Fordism that you reduce the costs of production and increase the uh, median income so that you can have this explosion of capitalist self feeding on itself in a very positive way. You create a consumer society, a large middle class capable. If you work in a factory, you can buy a car made in that factory. If you teach in a school, you can live in the town where you teach. If you work at a Starbucks, you can live within walking distance of that Starbucks because you make enough money. And it was this huge, well, Starbucks didn't exist during this time. Uh, it was this huge expansion that Robert Reich talks about in a previous lecture between World War II, especially, and 1973 and 1980 is when it kind of stopped. And that was Fordism, that was an expansion of the buying power of the vast majority of Americans, if you like. And it becomes the driving force of architectural fantasies that we're gonna look at next week. So let's skip some of this. And we saw this in history theory too, I think. Is this a familiar? One of the things that General Motors did, they hired architects to say, let's uh, create a vision for the future of the United States. Let's create a blueprint for the, for the construction of the future. And so the 1939 World's Fair in uh, Forest Hills, Queens, New York, uh, was one of the most successful World's Fairs of all time. And this was one of the most successful exhibitions at that World's Fair. Um, look at the lines. And basically, long story short, the architects produced their vision in a huge model with moving people and moving cars. And then to the, around the fixed model, 
put the people on a railway track so they could see the model and basically implanted this vision of the future of the New York City area. And at the time, it looked bizarre to everyone. But to us, it doesn't look so bizarre. A quarter of a mile high skyscrapers tower with convenient rest and recreational facilities for all. It looks very familiar. On many of the buildings it's are landing cool. decks for helicopters and auto gyros. And they <clears throat> built at full scale what they showed in the model. And when they walk out of the exhibition, they walk into this experience of New York City of the future with elevated walkways uh, separating the humans from the traffic. And this was the vision that was planted in the heads of people in 1939 by General Motors. Do you think the architects realized what they were doing when they designed this? Do you think that they realized that they were pretty much shaping what was going to happen? Oh, absolutely. That was their job. You know, General Motors needed to uh, create a vision that people would buy into that would require them to buy cars. And so who are you going to call? You call the architects to create an intoxicating vision of this glorious future. And they did it. They weren't evil. Not like the General Motors thing where they dismantle the streetcars. Well, even that, they thought they were doing the right thing. They thought they were very optimistic about the power of the automobile, how much superior, how superior it is to riding around like cattle in a rail car. They did not yet know uh, the depth of the impacts, uh, really, uh, arguably, the death of the planet is an unintended consequence of trying to do the right thing. That's the short version. So I'm stating it in dramatic terms. They didn't know any better. So we forgive Norman Bel Geddes, the architect of this exhibition, um, but what about us? If we continue to reproduce this system into the future for ourselves and uh, for the developing countries of the world, then that is a problem. Friends don't let friends reproduce the, uh, the dysfunctional system that has led to, long story short, the death of the planet. Robert Moses uh, was uh, the unelected director of infrastructure development for the state of New York. And he answered the question when the Interstate Highway Act was passed in 1956 and the interstate highway system was being funded by US tax dollars, not by real estate development, but by US tax dollars crossing the open landscape of the United States. The question was, what happens when the freeway arrives at cities? Robert Moses answered that question. The answer was and is, you plow the freeway right through the center of the city. And where do you locate that highway system? You, lo you draw the line. Let's, let's go forward a little bit. I'm going to change the order up a little bit. Let's look at Boston. So here's Boston. If you have to locate a highway system through the city, where are you going to put it? Well, you take the high value real estate and the low value real estate, you take that line and you, uh, you preserve what's on this side and then you bulldoze what's on the red side of that line and uh, you build the freeway there because the land values, property values are lower. It's less expensive to acquire that property. And, um, oh wait, I'm, I'm using the red line now. And where, where's my finger? What is that? What is here? Do you recognize this? 
That's where we are. So, wait a minute. That's the current interstate highway system. The, lo the politics of locating the freeway infrastructure. Here's the North End of Boston. Um, here's the highway. Sorry about the reversal of the angle. But basically, um, Italians were the Black community of the 1940s. And so we did the same thing, but to the North End. And we reduced the size of the Italian community and protected the downtown area from the negative influence of land values by the Italian community. And so that's where we built the freeway. And you can see this. I don't know if you've seen this site, but you can do this. You slide it across and you see the, the old and then the new with the highway. Um, so the big dig. The inner ring, so where do we put uh, the inner belt? Where do we put our roads? Um, we, we follow the redlining map to create the inner ring, the inner belt. Um, so Somerville, this, when, if and when you get to Union Square in your studio in the fall, this is a useful reference point. Um, the inner belt has been re revitalized as a rail corridor. This was defeated thanks to some of the heroes. Some of them have taught at Wentworth. They, when it uh, was trying to be implemented, uh, the community rose up with the participation of architects and this was stopped. This is what it was gonna look like. Let's see, where are we here? This looks very, this looks very familiar. This is that. We are here. This was the dividing line between the non-Black community and the Black community. You, you reinforce that dividing line. You reduce the size of the Black community by bulldozing that area, and that's where you build your freeway. It's just rational. It's just logical. Well, it got stopped, and in its place, we have the orange line, and we have Southwest Corridor. But it was going to go right through Nubian Square. Nubian Square lost its streetcar, and instead, that streetcar is replaced by a bus. Guess what the next big move of the MBTA is likely to be? It's a good thing. Replace the number one bus with a streetcar or a bus rapid transit. They're debating different possibilities. So where are we? The American automobility dream overseas. Let's revisit where we're at. How much does it cost to own an operated car? Let's look. Okay, there it is. Uh, Michigan is the most expensive state to own an operated car. It's $9,000 a year. Uh, Massachusetts is way down here because of the average vehicle miles traveled per licensed driver. How much driving do we do? Uh, we drive a lot. We drive five times more than anybody else in the world. We drive something like 15, 16,000 miles per licensed driver per year. In some places, uh, people drive more. Like Wyoming, it's something like 24,000 miles per driver per year. In Massachusetts, it's like 4,000. Why is that? 
because of Boston still has its green line, it still has some of its transit. Boston is one of the most walkable cities in the United States. More people walk to work in Boston than almost any other city. Um, but that only works when you can afford the housing in Boston. Um, I reorganized this according to miles. There's the Wyoming, uh, 21,000 miles. If you don't own and operate a car, how much money do you save in here? Should we take a bathroom break? It's a single use bathroom, no. always. Oh, <laughs> on this floor? Yeah, there's a this woman's bathroom. Awesome. No guys, discrimination. Potty parody. Ask me about potty parody sometimes when you get time. No time. How much does it cost uh, to own and operate a car each year? In the United States, six thousand, seven thousand dollars. But that's when the gas is two dollars and something. Um, so how much does it go up? This is the gas to fuel cost. So let's just double that and add it. So just add this column to that column, and now you've got the cost. So it's like eight thousand dollars a year this year. Insurance is in there. Buying the car. If you have a new car. It's like ten thousand dollars a year. So what if you don't have a car? Who's not going to have a car in ten years? They all go to the back. So if you don't have a car in ten years, let's just we're all friends. Let's just say it's ten thousand dollars in year of savings, right? What can you do with that ten thousand dollars? Pay for student loans. Invest it in Bitcoin. Both ideas are not good. Friends don't let friends do either of those things. Keep your student loans, cheap credit. Instead, uh, invest in housing as soon as you possibly can. And once you're on the other side of that home ownership line, you become the beneficiary of all that growth in real estate value. Until that time, that line, that barrier to ownership is going up. It's not going up slowly. It's a rocket ship going to the moon. Those of us on, on the good side of that line, we are able to send our children to college. Thank you very much. Those on this side of that line of homeownership, sorry, you, maybe you should work harder. As soon as you can, buy real estate because the prices are just going to go up and up and up. Don't tell Laurel, it's just more competition, right? So that's what you should do with your, your money. I've never owned a car in my life. What did I do with my money? I bought real estate. Are my kids going to college? Thank you very much. They are. I bought the best damn bicycle money can buy. You should see this thing. It is beautiful. It looks like it's electric, but it's not. It's all me. It's like a $3,000 bicycle. And when the transmission went out, I said, eh, no problem, give me a new wheel. $700 later for my bicycle, right? How do I justify that? How many years have I been a licensed driver, not owning a car? A lot of years. Some would say 40 something years. 40 something years times, let's call it, let's call it 300, thousand dollars thank you very much that's a lot of money that i never had to pay i can afford a very nice bicycle it weighs 80 pounds i can carry passengers on the back my son's hockey bag on the front no problem i can deliver him to hockey practice this is significant so um when you go remember the mortgage thing when you go to apply for a mortgage 
do they take that into consideration? The answer previously was no, they don't. The answer now is maybe. It's called a location. This, this is a term, I think it's a location based mortgage. Uh, they don't just look at your income and say 30% of that, you can afford a mortgage uh, that is 30% of your income after you pay off your student loans every month. 30% of what's left, you can spend that on housing. <clears throat> but a location based mortgage adds the factor of transportation. It used to be that American households spend about 30% of their income on housing and like five to 10% on mm -hmm. transportation. But it has increasingly gone up and up and up so that a lot of Americans are paying 60, 70% of their income on a combination of housing and transportation. And the two are related. So uh, you can, they, these transportation-based mortgages will allow you to spend more of your income on housing if you spend less of your income on transportation. Isn't that a beautiful thing? How do you spend less money on transportation? You purchase a house in a walkable neighborhood. So walkability scores is a really big deal in real estate pricing now. If your neighborhood is walkable, which means you can get to transit, get to work, get to church, get to your friend's house, all of a sudden it's easier for you to get a mortgage. That's the way it should be everywhere, um, but not yet. So that's one of the things that we hope to see change in the world. This is an interesting thing. So, uh, it seems like, so this is 1971, and this is now. The black line is the one I want you to look at. This is the annual increase or decrease. It just shows that during the pandemic, people didn't go anywhere. <clears throat> then it changed between this year and that year. It went up a lot. But the curve keeps going up. So that's the vehicle miles traveled per person in the United States. Are there more drivers now than there were in 1971? So we have to multiply this per person consumption by the number of people. And that's how we end the efficiency of our vehicles. In the 1970s, when I was reading popular science, I knew with absolute confidence that the world would solve these problems. Uh, by the 1980s, gas mileage of a Honda Civic was around 49 miles per gallon. And I knew that would just keep going up, that the fuel efficiency of vehicles was going to go up to 50, 60, 70 miles per gallon. But what happened? Consumer uh, demand said, I don't want a Honda Civic. I want a Hummer or a Jeep or some other SUV. And so that whole hope has been dashed, and in part because of the uh, system set up by General Motors and Ford, General Motors and Ford invented lobby, the lobby system, where industry, uh, an industry will pool their resources, hire professional lawyers to put on suits and go to Congress people's chambers, give generously to their campaign finance, um, to their uh, campaigns. And the lobby industry was invented by the automobile industry. That's why fuel efficiency standards have stagnated. That's why uh, the global carbon emissions from transportation just keeps going up. That's why the global uh, the per capita carbon emissions in the United States is among the highest in the world, but not the highest. Saudi Arabia, Canada, the more rural, so they drive more. The Middle East, that has something to do with the fact that uh, the United Arab Emirates, in order to pipe fresh water into the buildings in Dubai and uh, Abu Dhabi, they pull salt water from the ocean 
and they boil it to make fresh water and then they pipe it in pipes. So their energy consumption is enormous. China, which has the largest population in the world, followed or assumed to be exceeded by India, as they go up, as they follow the blueprint to the US, um, no matter what Greta Thunberg says, uh, and no matter what uh, optimistic, rosy pictures of per capita, the, the aggregate carbon emissions keeps going up and up and up. There are ways to make more efficient use of a single, it's crazy. Is that a car? It's a pickup truck. Some of those people. So the United States uh, automobile ownership curve, you know, the depression in the late 20s and 30s went down. Uh, and then after World War II, with the growth of suburbia, the car ownership rate uh, surpassed 750 cars per 1,000 population. And then way back in 1995, this is where different countries were on that scale. China was down here, now China's up here. Indonesia was not here, it's now Indonesia is around the same place as China, India. And uh, this is the foreign aid gained Japan, uh, gave money first to Thailand. And uh, that's a long story, we don't have time for that, sorry. Ring roads are in the cities around the world. The black one is Houston as the largest ring road system. And then quickly being joined by all the other major cities uh, in the world to, uh, you know, the ring road system is what drives automobile dependence. And so these are places overseas. There's a new interstate highway system going in India. Um, this is the United Nations road building uh, campaign uh, for Asia. And then comes China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they want to become a world superpower. We've talked about this in the past. One of the ways they're doing it is through foreign aid. Uh, we skipped over the story of Japan's foreign aid campaign, which was brilliant. Um, but we're going to uh, talk about China's. They are currently giving uh, enormous amounts of money to countries and cities around the world, very famously Sri Lanka, where when Sri Lanka defaulted on their loans, China took over their port in Colombo. Um, similar things are happening. This looks out of date because I know there's some big projects along here. Uh, but China is expanding its infrastructure development, especially in Africa. Africa is the big uh, prize in this global competition. And what happened on Sunday in relationship to this? What's that map in the top right? These are the receiving countries of China's global belt and road initiative to build uh, port infrastructure, airports, and mainly roads throughout the world. It's, it's modeled after Japan's. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll mention Japan because it's so crazy. After World War II, after the atomic bombs, uh, the American atom atomic bombs on, uh, in Japan, the decimation of Japanese cities, uh, the US wanted to rebuild Europe and rebuild Japan so that uh, these places could thrive in a, and be thriving trading partners in a global market-based system of the free world in competition with the Soviet Union, the communist world. And so we donated enormous amounts of money for infrastructure development in Europe and in Japan. And of course, what we do is we have this blueprint from General Motors and Futurama from Ford from the Athens Charter, which we'll talk about next week, 
we have these blueprints. Let's build road infrastructure. Let's build suburban sprawl in Europe. Let's build suburban sprawl in Japan. Well, in Japan, they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're not the United States. We have mountains. We have sacred forests. Uh, we don't have the space to uh, do an American model automobile dependent thing. It will limit our economic development capacity. And so Japan opted for the alternative of uh, developing an enormous automobile industry for the military vehicles to fight in the Korean War. And so during throughout the 50s, Japan became the automobile industry home of the Korean War, but the Korean War ended. Japan had to sell cars. They had a huge capacity. You can't sell it to the Japanese. That would cripple their economy. So they said, what's this foreign aid thing the United States has? Let's do some of that. So they donated uh, money for road building in Thailand. And Shazam, Bangkok became the most traffic congested city in the world. They sold lots of cars to Thailand. So they said, wow, that was beautiful. Let's set up an office in every city throughout Asia, Latin America, and Africa. There is an office of Japanese foreign aid pushing for road construction so the Japanese can sell cars to those countries while still restricting automobile sales in its own backyard. So they just did exactly what you got. Yeah. It's just they just created the demand. But they were smart enough to not do it to themselves. That would be like if Detroit kept its streetcars and then sold cars to the rest of the country. That's what Japan did. China is doing it more like GM. They're devastating their own cities and towns with automobile dependence, and then they're doing it to the rest of the world. Uh, as a, just because we don't have time, as a uh, plot towards world domination. What did what was the United States response last Sunday? to this. A $600 billion plan to basically, this is the headline, so it's not subtle. They are, although uh, Biden did not mention China once in his speech, that is exactly what's happening. They're trying to offer an alternative to the Chinese uh, dominate the world strategy, but this time the nation of G7. France, United Kingdom, Canada, right? He's the cute guy, Trudeau. Is that Trudeau? Yeah. That's this Sunday. So the Belt and Road Initiative, this whatever clever name, they don't even have a map yet. Right? This is the only image I could offer you guys. There's no map. China has a map, right? But they need architects. The infrastructure, the Build Back Better infrastructure plan, that is your career. We, I talked to my colleagues in, in, uh, in the private sector. They are going nuts. They can't hire fast enough. There is so much infrastructure development money. They need you guys fast. And this is just going to fuel that as well. Um, the question is, for you in your careers, are you going to uh, reproduce the, uh, and, and accelerate the death of the planet? Because that's the, that's the blueprint that we have on the shelf. we got to go with what we know. We're going to accelerate the death of the planet. Your bosses, well, this is what we know. You have to come up with something better. So this is one attempt in the 1990s to come up with something better. The Charter for the New Urbanism, uh, they modeled their, their program uh, after the International Congress of Modern Architecture that we're going to talk about next week. Um, and so maybe we'll circle back to this. The Charter is very good. Unfortunately, um, the group was hijacked by Andres Duan, a really disgusting person, sorry, um, who wants to pretend that he and his friends or the United States invented this stuff. 
just for the record, we know better. They didn't invent it. it it's normal before World War II. You can't give it a new name and say we invented it. And by the way, he's also he, he's very proud of saying there are 154 uh, colleges and universities that offer architecture degree programs. Only four of them have embraced uh, anything remotely resembling this. Ridiculous. He, he dismisses the rest of us as being obsessed with avant-garde artistic productions. And I don't think that's true. That may have been true when I was in school, but he's hopelessly out of touch. That said, the transect is a useful um, tool for understanding the relationship between different zones. And the key consideration is uh, at the highest density, you don't want this to go on forever. You want a quick transition to medium density, and you want that to be in relationship to uh, corridors of recreational open space. So, and maybe even suburbia. Why not? Uh, we can afford some suburban sprawl. It's just we need to mix it up more. Uh, and so this is a very reasonable model for development on a very interesting history to how it got to where it is, that um, uh, Peter Calthorpe was one of the uh, six architects who formed this group uh, originally. And look, principles based on analysis of what works, and here's what it looks like. We almost had this reading, but I decided to do this more recent one because it's better. But here are design guidelines. Uh, parking spaces, instead of eight feet or 10 feet wide, make them seven feet wide. Travel lanes, how wide are they on a freeway? 15 feet wide. So you can go really fast. If you want to slow down traffic in town, 10 feet is plenty. Right? How wide should a sidewalk be? How wide should a bike run be? What should be the relationship between each of those things? That is something that we are asked to figure out what should an intersection look like. We should bump it out to make the crossing shorter. Where have we seen that? Right between Annex Central and where we are, there's a bump out. So let me add to the complexity of the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, at the same time that we're solving for climate change, we're going to be building cities for 3 billion people. That's a doubling of the urban environment. If we don't get that right, I'm not sure all the climate solutions in the world will save mankind. Because so much depends on how we shape our cities, not just environmental impacts, but our social well-being, our economic vitality, our sense of community and connectedness. Fundamentally, the way we shape cities is a manifestation of the kind of humanity we bring to bear. And so getting it right is, I think, the order of the day. And to a certain degree, getting it right can help us solve climate change, because in the end, it's our behavior that seems to be driving the problem. Uh, the problem isn't free floating, and it isn't just ExxonMobil and oil companies. It's us, how we live. How we live. There's a villain in this story. It's called sprawl, and I'll be upfront about that. But it's not just the kind of sprawl you think of or many people think of as low-density development out at the periphery of the metropolitan area. Actually, I think that sprawl can happen anywhere at any density. The key attribute is that it isolates people. It segregates people into economic enclaves and land use enclaves. It separates them from nature. Uh, it doesn't allow the cross fertilization, the interaction that make cities great places and that make society thrive. I'll leave the rest. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a link to this TED talk in WhatsApp. Um, I wanna get to any good alternatives. So, and I also want to plant the seed that the, that the final destination of the course, what we're hoping for is 
uh, some principles backed up by simple, a simple paragraph and a diagram, maybe something more than this paragraph, but a diagram not so different from this, where did the Congress for New Urbanism come up with its principles? Where did the Congress for the International Congress for Modern Architecture come up with the Athens Charter? Uh, we can do that. That's actually the destination uh, of the course. Where did this book from 20, 1921 come up with all these architectural visions for good places? It came up from looking at real life situations, analyzing what's working and not working, and how and why, and developing some guidelines. Sorry, I lost. Oh, okay. Um, uh, this other book that's going around, Great Streets, where did these ideas come from? Uh, where did these ideas come from? It came from architects using our mad skills of analysis to look at the world, figure out what's going on, how is the architecture producing positive impacts, and developing principles that can then be translated and put into place. How do we create more walkable uh, neighborhoods to reduce automobile dependency? William H. White is an urbanist and is the mentor of a project for public spaces because of his seminar work and the study of human behavior in urban settings. For nearly two decades, White has been observing how people use streets and public spaces. Although city is about the design and management of urban spaces, White's true fascination is with the life and rituals of people out on the streets. For him, the street is a stage. In his article about the social life of the street, Boy talks about the different aspects that are related to how people move around the city, specifically in New York, which is basically where he lives. Here he talks about street behavior, street conversations, and the like. In the first part of the article, Boy talks about street conversations. Here he shares an experiment that he did with his research team which required them to focus time-lapse cameras on several street corners and recorded the activity for two weeks. On maps of the corners, they plotted the location of each conversation and how long it lasted. And to screen out people who were only waiting for the light to change, they noted only those conversations lasting a minute or longer. The results of the activity were not at all as expected. Even White didn't expect it, as it showed that people who stopped to talk did not move out of the pedestrian flow. And if they had been out of it, they'd moved into it. Transit-oriented development is not new. If you're in Japan and you're looking for the train station, well, if you're in the United States and you're looking for the train station, where do you look? You look for the open space where there's no buildings, because our train stations are surrounded by parking lots. That's the opposite of what transferring developments would say. In Japan, when you're lost and you're looking for the train station, you just look for the tallest building. There it is. That's where the train station is, just the tallest buildings. Same with every other city that has transit-oriented development. That's how we know where Ruggle Station is, or will soon, as this transit-oriented development model increases the density within a quarter mile of the transit stop and some re reduction of parking responsibilities uh, within a quarter. You know, so that's transit-oriented development, increased density, lower parking requirements. Jan Giel. I mean, the cargo bike, you can teach your children to, to bicycle from their five years. You can walk around with the kindergarten on the sidewalks in the parks and the squares and the pedestrian streets. And, and thinking about it, you see many children in a city like Copenhagen. And that has led me to say that if you see a city with many children and many old people, 
using the city, the public spaces, then it's a sign that there is a good quality for people in that particular city. What has actually happened mm -hmm. is that uh, mm -hmm. at first they, they started to push out the traffic from various streets and squares in the medieval city. But later on, they moved out to other parts of the city. And in 2009... Where else can you look? Who has developed and implemented the principles of Vision Zero and Complete Streets? Zero, zero what? Zero traffic accidents by pedestrians and non-motorized vehicles. Complete streets? In what way complete? Complete for all users. The idea of jaywalking was invented by an advertising firm in the 1920s. The idea that the street is off limits to humans was an insane, crazy idea invented in the marketing department, and it worked. Now it's illegal to walk in the street, and if someone runs over you, it's your fault, not theirs. The Mega City is a reality, and it looks a lot like the visions of science fiction films. Giga cities are soon to be. In the midst of this cold, bleak vision of the future, we have the human being. It is personal, warm, social. Nobody knew that the way we built cities had any influence on lifestyles and people's life. I think we made a lot of the same mistakes as the uh, Western countries has made. No time. Any questions? Yes. What kind of plane do you want us to go to the analysis? I mean, you just mentioned Copenhagen. Oblique perspective, aerial views of successful uh, transformations with architectural scale human experience in the foreground, the larger urban pattern context in the background. Some place where you can interrogate the image, the visual evidence, in a way that yields insights as to what the architecture is doing and how it's doing it. First, through a series of uh, logical sequence of five points, and then stringing those together through some thematic thread to a claim and a provocative question. Boom. Does it have to do with our model of automobiles yeah. and transportation and stuff? It should be. Uh, the architecture of an urban realm that uh, somehow manages the interplay between all of these different activities. So uh, maybe you are going to look at a place where there were cars and now they're gone, but it actually those are so rare and it's hard to propose that. It get a lot easier to propose that when we have uh, self-driving cars. But um, uh, what, what do you want to figure out? I, I want this to be driven by your curiosity, your need to know. What do you need to know? The school brought you to its place and it's not good enough. What do you need to know to complete your education? What do you want to know about how streets are made more uh, functionally, better functioning places? What's the architecture of uh, the scale beyond the street, beyond the building? The, the architectural scale beyond the building itself is the collection of buildings that produce the streets. It's the architecture of the street. Is I think that's the suggestion. All right. Thank you very much. So, 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 so.
Amsterdam, we also want a great city to work on. Yes. Because I was, I was thinking like Central. Yes. Like Central, yeah. And like the train station, how that corresponds in the bike lanes. I think I showed a slide of a beautiful analysis of um, Central Station in Amsterdam. Yeah. You know, I, I've been like looking kind of, but uh, this is more, this is like Central, so yeah. right here. In the dumb rock. Yeah. I actually live right there. You did? Yeah. Where? Right on the street. Bodestrat. Which one is it? Bodestrat. Bodestrat? Strat. Oh, Strat. Yeah, it wasn't street. a Strat. Yeah. S T R A A. Yeah, it was a Strat. Bodenstrat. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, what is the coolest lesson that can be learned from Amsterdam? for you to share with us. Okay. That's what we want. Um, and we're very selfish. Like coming, like going into like the also transformation. Well, we want to see the architecture transformed. If you need to add additional images okay. for 20 seconds, that's great. Okay. Um, for the readings that yes. you want us to pick, should we uh, try